Great Lakes Now, Connect, is a co-production of Detroit Public Television and The Nature Conservancy. Hi there, and thanks so much for joining us for Great Lakes Now Connect. I'm Christy McDonald. Our program today is a joint effort between Detroit Public Television and the Nature Conservancy to focus on issues that impact the Great Lakes and in turn, all of us who live around the Great Lakes Basin. After a long winter, we are all starting to enjoy a much needed spring. And I know it's spring when my kids look out the window and they shout, there's a robin. You know, millions of migratory birds are making their way back north. Some of them are making their home near the Great Lakes. Others are using our region as a stopover site as they head further north to nest. Today, it is all about birds and their connection to the Great Lakes and why the event of migration gives us an idea of how healthy the lakes are as well as our environment. We have a studio audience today, plus a panel of experts to take a look at migratory birds in the Great Lakes, the passion that people have to watch them, study them, and protect them, and how they connect with our environment. We'll be taking questions throughout the show, so make sure you send them to us on Facebook and on Twitter at Great Lakes Now. So let's start things off with Dr. Patrick Doran with a nature Conservancy. He's the Director of Conservation for Michigan. Patrick, it's always good to see you. How are you doing, Christine? I'm doing very, Excuse very me. well. <laughs> you know, we're talking about birds today, and I and we have talked so many mm -hmm. times about issues in the Great Lakes, and I always find that you have to start off with a passion somewhere right. in life to, to get to doing the work that you're doing with the Nature Conservancy. So you have to tell me, what's the background on birds for you? When did you start watching birds? You know, I think uh, that's a good point. We always worry about these issues, but where's the passion? Where's the passion of our work, and, and where's that start? and how does that get to someone. Um, many times I think back to when, when I was a kid, you know, when I, I, I'm working in conservation, I've dedicated my life to doing conservation work, and it wasn't one big episode that said, yes, this is what I have to mm -hmm. do. And I think back to when I was a kid, um, we had bird feeders this is back in the 70s. We had bird feeders. I don't know how many moms and dads had bird feeders back in then. Um, and it was the 70s, right? There was always a lot of snow, and I was the one in charge of filling the bird feeders, going down the that garage, was your job. dropping it out. It was my job, get the bird seed, go out and for, do the bird feeders. And we had this big old house with the big old radiator heaters, right? And I used to sit on that radiator and look out this big picture window at the bird feeders. Um, and it was just fascinating. You know, it's cardinals and juncos and, and, the, and the downy woodpeckers. And so one day this, this incredibly mysterious bird shows up. Like I'd never seen it before. The six-year-old me has never seen this. All right, so, so what did you do? It's incredibly, you know, so I went and I grabbed my bird book. Oh, is that your bird book from bird when you book were little? From when I was a little boy. It has no cover. It has no cover. Um, but I called my mom and dad and I said, you know, this bird, what is this thing? And, and we went through this bird book and went page by page and this incredibly mysterious thing. And it's kind of gray and it's got a, a crest and it's got a little orange on its side. And this was the incredibly mysterious tufted titmouse, which is dirt. <laughs> you know, it's a dirt common bird that's never in anybody's backyard. All the birders are laughing right now. They're laughing, right now. yeah. Because, it, because it's not that mysterious, but to that young six-year-old who'd never seen anything like this, it was different, it was comical, it was mysterious, um, and it taught me a lot. It taught me that, that power of discovery. It taught me taxonomy as I went through my bird book and had to figure it out and identify. It taught me that, 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 that desire and that excitement of seeing and discovering something new. It, well, and I think it also really shows what our you know, original connections to nature can start off with when you start young like that, and then it can, it can grow and you can learn so much more about how it affects the environment all around us. Right, we're, we're gonna talk about birds today and how they are a perfect avenue for connecting people to nature, either through their outdoor activities or, or hunting or bird watching or, or any means. Um, it's a perfect way of connecting people for nature. They're good indicators of ecological health. Um, they're, they're fascinating to watch. The colors, the sizes, the shapes, the events, they're all amazing. All right, and we're going we're gonna to take a look at that bird book, too, because we'll I, I, I see you have a couple of other sticker pages. You, you, in I there. do have a couple <laughs> other sticker pages in here. You have to be careful when you turn the page. Though. All right, well, you know, thanks a lot, Patrick. For a lot of people, as what Patrick and I were saying, our first connection with birds comes simply with the enjoyment of watching them, whether it's from our kitchen window or in the middle of the woods or along the shoreline. And it's the beginning of a connection to nature around us. My name's Bob Anthony. I, I'm an amateur birder and photographer. Birding's a chance to be outside, a chance to enjoy nature, listening to the, the rustle of the leaves of the trees or the pine needles or the water running and bird calls. Photography lets me tell a story the world just opens up to you. 
I just like to go out and just push the shutter, and continue to push the shutter. Birds are all around you in, in different form, color, song, and it's not the same every day. It, it's something different, something new. Birds are, are, are an indicator of the health of the landscape, the waters, the forest, um, the natural areas. We are very fortunate to have a major flyway up the Detroit River through Lake St. Clair and on further north. Now, Belle Isle itself is particularly interesting for the waterfowl. It's a great place in the spring migrations to go observe birds. The thing about photography is it allows me to, to really capture my experiences in the outdoors, my experiences with birds. And as you, you look at those pictures, it just gets you excited about, gee, uh, all of this is going on in this world, this wonder of creation, and uh, how can we preserve it for our children and our grandchildren and, and the future generations yet to come. Those pictures are just beautiful, and it is more urgent than ever before to make sure that we support and protect migratory birds. To start our first discussion on the importance of the Great Lakes region to birds and bird migration, I'll send it over to Patrick now. Patrick, go ahead. Thanks, Christy. That was a great video. Wow. Um, and I think what it really does is tie us to nature and using birds as that avenue. So today we have with us um, Melinda Pruitt Jones. She is the executive director of the American Ornithologist Union and the past um, executive director of Chicago Wilderness, as well as John Hartig, who's a refuge manager of the Detroit International Wildlife Refuge. Thanks for joining us today and thanks for um, starting our discussion. So today we're going to first cover kind of why the Great Lakes? Tell us a little bit about migration, and then later on we're going to talk a little bit more about the conservation that we do for migratory birds. So, Melinda, this time of year is just a spectacular time of year, um, and I don't think that most people understand the migration, the nature of migration. So can you tell us a little bit about where these birds are coming from and where they're going to? Well, migration is, I think, one of the world's greatest spectacles, and every year billions of birds globally are are moving long distances from one place to another for a variety of reasons, but it's um, for food and whether it's in grasslands or wetlands, um, they're going after insects or fish. Um, they're, they're traveling from um, food rich areas from the wintering grounds to food rich um, uh, areas where they would breed and raise their young. And so the Great Lakes is an incredible place for, as Christy explained, you know, both we have birds that are migrating here to breed, shorter migrations, and other birds that are coming through and stopping over and going north. Yeah, so John, there's this concept of flyways, and, and can you tell us, describe flyways a little bit, and why the Great Lakes is at an intersection of this incredible flyways? Yeah, so migration routes come together and form flyways. You have major ones, uh, so think of, uh, um, migration routes is a subset of, of flyways. And here um, we have the intersection right where we're sitting of the intersection of two major flyways, the Atlantic and the Mississippi, and well-known routes where birds travel to, uh, um, for, for, to breeding grounds and then to overwinter, searching food, searching cover, searching rest. So. Um so what makes this area unique? John, you talked about that intersection of flyways, but are there some other factors here that are really uh, unique for these birds? Well, in these long migrations, like you think of uh, Detroit River, they need stopover habitat. They need, um, they need these islands. These, they need woodlots, grasslands, um, wetlands. If you think of it from a waterfowl perspective, all the waterfowl that migrate from Canada down, um, they stop to rest and feed on, mm -hmm. on wild celery in the river. Just think of diving ducks, and, and it's an amazing phenomenon to see. Um, you can still see today, you can stand at the mouth of the Detroit River, and you can watch, and there are enough ducks sitting out there when they lift off the water that it will change the color of the sky. Wow. I always think, um, this is one of my favorite examples, somebody showed me this, well, some of these songbirds that have come through, they weigh about nine or ten grams. You know, that's about as much as three nickels in your hand. And these birds are flying 
1,000, 2,000, maybe more miles. And so the importance of all those habitats you talked about, and again, not just natural areas, but in our urban areas as well, right, Melinda? Mm -hmm. Well, and as you talk about small birds, um, one, of the bir one of the smallest birds that we're all familiar with is the um, ruby-throated uh, uh, hummingbird. hummingbird. Yeah. <laughs> it flies 2,000 miles. Yeah and it loses half of its body weight when it's traveling. And uh, they fly over the Gulf of Mexico, and then they fly over the corn and soybean deserts of our, you know, of our productive landscapes. And when they get up to the um, woodlands and the you know, urban forests to protected uh, forests and, and woodlands, um, they get very busy eating and, 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 and getting their weight back on. And then the, what's interesting too is how females and the males actually travel at different times. So they, they segregate their uh, their migration timing so right. that if something happens, you know, the whole population is not affected. So one of my colleagues, Dave Ewart, often talks about the habitat needs and he talks about kind of the fire escapes and the convenience stores and the full service hotels that all these birds need because they're oftentimes um, starving, very, very hungry, and they need just any place is good to, to refuel. Right. Yeah. Mm. So John, tell me also about kind of um, we see some threats to these birds as they're migrating through. Uh, migration is a very stressful time of the year. Most birds in the lifespan, the highest mortality is during migration. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of threats are they facing here in the mm -hmm. Great Lakes or, 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 or obstacles or barriers to these migrations? Mm -hmm. In Detroit, they're coming through and you can imagine uh, everything from uh, skyscrapers and glass windows to wet cooling towers that they cannot differentiate, you know to uh, wind turbines out in there, a whole variety of things. Um, predation coming through. We have uh, the common terns are just returning right now and one of the biggest source of, of mortality is predation in, during the nesting season. So there's a whole variety of, of factors in that. Mm -hmm. And what do you see also, I mean, when you work in Chicago region, what are you seeing there as well? Well, as Fred said, you have the bird collisions um, happening with respect to the buildings, and what they found in Chicago is by lowering the lights, they reduced the mortality by 80%, which was very significant. And they probably save a little energy, too. They did, and, <laughs> and there's almost 300 species of birds that migrate through Chicago. Um, one of the biggest threats is uh, domestic cats. And so keeping your cats indoors is really, really important for birds during migration. And then the fragmentation of the landscape as right. well. Now we were talking earlier too, and, and you mentioned that, you know, these birds have no sense of, of property boundaries or state boundaries or political boundaries. So every bit of land and how we manage these lands is just as important. That's right, yeah. absolutely right. Um, so when we get down to kind of the, the management of these stopover sites, John, what do you see on the ground that uh, we can start to do or how we manage or treat or, or protect our lands? Well, all these habitats are important. Wetlands, we've lost 97% of our coastal wetlands on the Detroit River. That means what's left is so vital, so precious, and we need to re have a net gain. We need to restore that back. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the stopover habitats. We are so developed. We have seven million people in a 45 minute drive, you know, mm -hmm. and there's so much um, concrete and steel and everything else. And, and so we need to build back stopover habitats. What we're doing in, um, through the International Wildlife Refuge is, is obviously the federal government or the state government or whomever could not do it by themselves. It has to be everyone working together. So we're working with corporations right now. Um, we are, uh, our enabling legislation talks about using um, public-private partnerships. So if a power plant only needs a certain percentage of its land to produce energy, um, could we work with them through a cooperative management agreement mm -hmm. to manage lands, and that's what we're doing. 656 acres with DTE right. um, called the Laguna Beach Unit. Um, we have other examples with consumers power, and BASF is managing Fighting Island, right. 1,200 acres in the river uh, for stopover habitat. So we have to do it all together. It's all important from what government does, the non-governmental sector, mm -hmm. to cities, to corporations, to backyard habitat. Right. All right, well thanks. Um, we're gonna shift to another video or some questions from the audience now that are gonna further up 
um, some of our knowledge. Yeah, I think I'd like to open it up right now because this has already started a very interesting conversation of how birds are adapting in our ever-changing en environment right now. So I want to open it up. Who's got, who's got some questions? Do you have a question, ma'am? Come on, stand up and tell us who you are, where you're from. Thank you. My name is Lana Jerome, and I'm with Grass Lake Sanctuary. Okay, Lana. We are um, a retreat sanctuary between Chelsea and Manchester, and we host retreats for women recovering from breast cancer, but we're also a 145-acre nature preserve. Oh, wonderful. So my question is, while we've got great diversity, how can we, on a large scale, help our neighbors? We have a Creatures in Residence program, so whether they're passing through, we'd like them to feel at home. How can we help our friends that are passing? I mean, it's really important to us. It's important, and it's, it seems like it would be a simple question, but it's one I think that we all kind of have on our mind. How can we help? Who would like to tackle that one? We'll look at you, Melinda. Yes. <laughs> well, so um, I think, as um, was explaining, you know, it's the partnership. So as you think about um, whether it's your backyard and your community, how you can be working together to think about your landscape more holistically. Um, the connectivity uh, from one, you know, one landscape, whether it's your local library and school and the uh, park and uh, business and et cetera, you know, how all that landscape fits together. And that you actually set a common goal and work on that goal together. And that way, uh, you have a greater impact for wildlife, not only birds, but wildlife generally. Um, and you're creating habitat that um, provides um, shelter, food, um, nesting sites, uh, breeding sites, you know, all the different uh, uh, aspects of habitat that they need, but big enough so that you're getting populations in there that can uh, sustain themselves. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point. I think you can manage your land yourself with those native plantings, with providing all different kind of structure, small shrubs, tall trees, grassland areas, but then you can also keep working out and talking to your neighbors about how they uh, manage their land, talking to your township about how they manage their natural lands. John? We, we call that working beyond uh, our boundaries. Mm -hmm. We all have to learn to work beyond our boundaries if we're going to achieve our common goals. So working on schoolyard habitat and industrial habitat and uh, parks. And, and the other aspect of this is when there is new development, um, and this has come to the forefront in Detroit, with the Detroit River Walk, you have five and a half miles of waterfront being redeveloped from the ground up, and it's the largest by scale urban waterfront redevelopment project in the United States. It's at the design phase that we can add in unique habitat features, some stopover habitat to do some really special things. So we need to be doing that. And great to be able to take advantage of that resource that we do have there on the D Detroit River. Who else has a question? that we want to go to right now. Don't be shy. Come on, stand up, ma'am. Tell us who you are and where you're from. I'm Susan Cooper, and I'm from Birmingham, Michigan. I've been associated with Detroit Public Television uh, for many, many years. All right, Susan, what's your question? It's a very ordinary question, but it uh, relates to the previous question in a way. Uh, it's always been controversial at whether backyard bird feeding is a plus or a negative for, for birds, and I would like your opinion as to whether uh, the stop and start method, feeding only in the winter, uh, or should you be feeding year-round? Uh, is which is better, or neither, or a combination? Melinda, do you want to take a first shot at that one too? If you can. Well, I think there's many schools of thought on it. Um, there are some organizations that have done some really wonderful research on this. Uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is a really good resource to answer that question, um, and what's right for you, and what's right for your habitat. Um, uh, there are many people that feed just in the winter because they are uh, they're landscaping their land, their, their backyard and their front yard for wildlife. Um, others that are living um, perhaps in a more sterile environment, it's all lawn in the front, that feeder might be very, very important year round. So I think you could find um, really good resources um, from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology on that. I mean, I tend to look at um not just the feeding station, but my whole yard as an opportunity to provide habitat for birds. So making sure that I have those native plantings that are providing seed and or berries throughout the year. Um, so it goes much more beyond the, the bird feeding. And I, I guess also, I mean, part of the reason we feed, feed the birds is for our own personal enjoyment and to tie us to nature. So I wouldn't want to get so caught up in worrying about the impact on birds that I forget about my own personal reasons, my own personal enjoyment, because because it is it's highly gratifying and satisfying. And again, my first experience was at those bird feeders, and I wouldn't want to, to have lost that. 
All right, well, this sets up a very interesting discussion, I think, as, as we move forward here. Now, a look at how scientists are actually able to track bird migration, where they stop, where they're headed, why it's so important, and what we can do to protect this system for the birds. Each year as the weather warms, millions of birds of all shapes and sizes and colors make their annual trip north. For migrating birds, the Great Lakes region is an essential part of their long and often dangerous journey. For some migrants, the Great Lakes Basin is a destination for raising their young, but most simply stop here to rest and refuel on their way to and from temperate breeding grounds further north. Most birds spend the day fattening up. They start the next leg of their journey as the sun sets over the Great Lakes, traveling long distances under the cover of darkness. This makes migration difficult to observe. To shine some light on these nocturnal migrations, Dr. Jeff Bueller uses a technology that's been around for a long time, weather radar. Here in the U.S., we have a network of over 150 weather radar stations that have been collecting data 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every five to 10 minutes. Meteorologists use radar to predict weather by detecting raindrops in the air. But this technology can also be used to detect flying animals like birds, bats, and even insects. Physicists have told us that uh, radars are uh, theoretically capable of detecting a bumblebee at 50 miles away. And so we get a measure of how much biomass is in these volumes of, of airspace that the radar sample. And so that allows us to actually detect birds regardless of whether it's night or day and to be able to see where they're going, how quickly they're moving, what direction they're flying. Connecting the dots between each radar allows Dr. Bueller to get a broad scale view of migration and to identify hot spots of activity in areas where birds most frequently stop to rest and refuel before continuing their journeys. Conservation organizations are able to use these maps that we can produce with the radar observations to identify where they want to spend their limited resources in order to conserve lands that will support high numbers of birds during migratory stopover. The clues that radar provide about where birds are going and stopping during migration are an important piece of a puzzle that biologists are trying to put together in order to conserve migrating bird populations. So a lot of these long distance migratory songbirds have been declining in, over the period of maybe the last 30 years and that was kind of when we really started sounding the alarm and uh, at the same time started looking at these migratory stopovers as an important part of their life cycle. By collecting seeds from fecal samples of birds, Dr. Craves can study what fruits birds are eating at these areas of stopover habitat and which resources are most important to birds during migration. They need to have the right resources to have the strength and energy to be able to complete their journey. It's like if your car runs out of gas before you hit the next gas station, you're in big trouble. Understanding what birds are eating is important because whether or not a bird can find enough food during migration is a matter of life or death. And to fly long distances, birds need to eat a lot. Birds can put on a substantial amount of fat in a very short period of time. So it's equivalent to, say, a 100-pound person putting on 10 pounds in one day. Birds do this. They can gain 10% of their body mass in one day during this period of time prior to migration in order to gain the fat they need to fuel a long-distance flight. Dr. Owen studies the insect diet of migrating birds. By taking breathalyzer samples, she measures isotopes that can actually tell us what a given bird has eaten. We're looking at the stable uh, carbon-13 signature because insects that are primarily aquatic have a different carbon signature than terrestrial insects. So we can see if the bird is primarily eating aquatic-derived insects or if it's terrestrial-derived insects. If it is aquatic-derived insects, that, we know that occurs near near-shore habitats. But increasingly, birds are finding shorelines highly developed, and many areas of high-quality stopover habitat have been altered. It then becomes particularly important to understand how birds use any remaining habitat to better protect them. Birds, like people, like coastal areas. And because humans like shorelines just as much as birds, we've put our cities there. 
And so these birds are following ancient paths and going along uh, coastal areas because the water is there, but the natural habitat isn't as much anymore. And so we really need to understand how birds are using these areas and what we can do to help them um, have the proper resources so that this ancient migratory journey can continue. The tireless work of all these researchers is producing a wealth of data on the behavior of migratory birds, contributing to the scientific literature. Dr. Dave Ewart at the Nature Conservancy uses this information to compile existing knowledge of stopover habitat for migratory birds into one resource that promotes conservation. The Nature Conservancy has worked with a lot of collaborators to try to come up with a tool that people can use, a decision-making tool, to better focus their scarce resources on the most important stopover sites. So we developed a web portal that summarizes our findings so the public can access those and say, okay, this site's really important, this one is less important based on the criteria we've derived, and we hope this will then help drive conservation programs in the Great Lakes region. As many migrating populations have been declining, and people in the Great Lakes Basin are becoming more interested in viewing these birds firsthand, more conservation activity can result in a win-win for people and nature in the region. I think as a society, we've always promoted good stewardship of the land, and birds are part of that stewardship. So as we protect birds, we're protecting other parts of our landscape and vice versa. And if we take that perspective, I think we'll all be better off, certainly ecologically, economically, and for the long-term maintenance of our society. Thanks and welcome back. And now we're going to um, enter into discussion of a little bit about the science and the practice of bird conservation. But looking back at that video, that's why I became a scientist. Those, those cool techniques, cool ways of investigating and, and solving these puzzles and mysteries of these great migrations that we talked about earlier. Um, Melinda, we saw some of those great images of the, the Doppler weather images. Have you seen those before? Or what do you what do you know about those? Things? Yes, you know, in Chicago, uh, there's an alliance called Chicago Wilderness, and it's hundreds of organizations that co cooperate um, in order to think about that that land stewardship, that that land ethic, how we protect, restore, and um, and connect habitats uh, for people and for wildlife. And this, they have developed a coordinated open space plan called the Green Infrastructure Vision for Chicago region. And um, what's really interesting, it's a mosaic of, of woodlands and wetlands, dunes, grasslands. Public and private. Public, yeah. private, corporate, um, that are just uh, uh, throughout the Chicago region. And that, the Chicago region is seven million acres and it starts in Wisconsin and comes through Illinois, Northwest Indiana, and in, actually into Michigan. But uh, that coordinated open space plan, when you, when you map it to a Doppler image of migratory birds lifting off on one of those perfect nights with right. a south wind, it's 100% overlap. Yeah. So that habitat is so critical for, for the birds and the investment um, in this protection and restoration, so improving those stopover sites um, has a huge impact on migratory yeah. birds. So John, it's, it's not just the science informing our conservation, we also do the science as a way to engage people in, in nature as well. And I know you're familiar, or you work with some, uh, mm -hmm. some citizen science programs in the Detroit River area. Absolutely, you know, like the, the science, you know, during the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the organochlorine pesticide contamination was so severe that we had reproductive failure of bald eagles and peregrine falcons and ospreys and, 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 and and common terns in there too, and and uh, not only did did were they affected by chemicals, but then we destroyed their habitat. We uh, um, we did everything possible to decrease their abundance, and so uh, we have seen some dramatic improvement in okay. the chemical contamination levels for these birds. And so common terns now, we, science science tells us that they're more limited by habitat, their productivity now. So could we begin? to um, restore habitat right. and, and engage high school students, engage NGOs, have people vested in this, I help do this. And so that's exactly what we're doing in building common turn habitat. So what's it actually look like? What are it's you a, building? It's gravel, I mean, think of um, nesting of common turns here and, 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 and bringing gravel out to the abutments of bridges that go to Grosio, Michigan and having 
students from high schools and the green team from DTE Energy lay it down. Then you have to provide some cover in there too and you have to grow certain species. Um, and then you have to think about predation. But, but it's working. So on Belle Isle, we had partnership with Detroit Public Schools, right. Detroit Zoo, a whole, whole bunch of school children. And we've built out on Belle Isle some habitat and we fl fledged two common terns a year ago for the first time in 40 years. It's not an exceptional right, number, right. but it's, it's heartening. And, and if, you know, it's so wonderful to see and it's engaging people in the work of conservation and engaging them in caring for the place they call home. And so I, there's this theme here of it's not just one individual or one organization or one agency, it's that commonality. And again, you mentioned Chicago Wilderness, that's how many organizations working together? 320. 320. So it takes that common vision amongst them all. Um, we oftentimes, uh, you know, we can get caught up in the talks about, oh, it's, it's for the birds, it's for the birds, it's for the birds, and, and we, we, you, us three are, are, are lovers and bird watchers. Um, you know, we just l love getting out there during those migrations and seeing those events. But it's also a, an economic benefit, and there's other ties to people. We're coming upon um, this great mig spring migration, and North America's biggest week of birding is in the Toledo area. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you see there in terms of those e types of events drawing people to nature? It's amazing, the economic return. Uh, we like to talk about birding as an economic engine, you know. Uh, Think of the National Wildlife Refuge System. Uh, every five years they do a study called Banking okay. on Nature. So they get upper end economists right. to come together and quantify what are the benefits, what are the economic return on what we do. And so um, uh, literally uh, 40, 47 million people 16 years and older go birding in National Wildlife Refuge System. Wow. The economic return in one year for that is over $250 million. Wow. There's $74 million in jobs that come from birding. So it's an economic engine. And if, and if you go to the warbler capital right, of the right. world or you see the, one of the three best places to watch hawks during hawk fest, you get a sense of this, and it's an amazing phenomenon, and it's, and it's an economy. It helps s sustain our communities. Melinda? And of those 47 million people that uh, love birds and, right. and are birders, 80% um, of them um, really start and, and are passionate about what's happening in their backyard. And uh, with so many people living in urban areas uh, today, 80% of our population in North America uh, live in, in uh, urban, uh, urban metropolitan regions or an urban area. And, and that first connection to nature often is your backyard, and birds are just such a wonderful, wonderful introduction to nature. Yeah, it did. I mean, that's where my story was, that backyard mm -hmm. is where it all started. So what can we do kind of both locally from our backyard, but regionally to these vast, broader urban areas, or to a whole region like the western shore of Lake Erie or, or the yeah. Chicago Wilderness region? Yeah, I think stewardship is one of the key words, is that engagement, getting involved, and um, uh, thinking about what you can do on your own landscape, but how you can help be part of that uh, growing body of knowledge of what's going on with birds. They're a wonderful indicator mm -hmm. of what's going on in, in the natural world, sure. environmental changes, they're responding, they're adapting, um, they're beautiful, they're, you know, they're diverse. Um, it's a great way to, um, to introduce your family, your children, um, and, and get them involved in both the stewardship of, of the habitat but also understanding what's going on with them and contributing to science. Yeah. It's, it's sometimes frustrating to stop over habitat is, is hard for some people to understand. And if you go out to a community or a business or something, say we want to create stopover habitat and it's a whole educational process. But um, what a great opportunity here to, to engage, you know, through the work of schoolyard habitat and Boy Scouts and, and, and challenging businesses to do the right thing. And, and we need to do that and we need to work beyond the boundaries as we said to, to do that more. Um, Melinda said, you know, 80% of the people in the United States live in urban areas. Where's the next generation of conservationists going to come from? Right. It's, exactly it's going to be from urban areas. We need to do far more to engage people in outdoor recreation like birding and engage them in conservation work 
so they can help become yeah. a conservation That's leader. A perfect way to, um, to wind it up there. How are we going to get those next generation of conservation leaders? Um, thank you very much. And now we're going to toss it over to uh, Christy and discussion with Sharon Sorensen. All right, thanks so much, Patrick. A really good discussion of what can be done to help conserve migratory bird habitat. You know, many people have made it their life's work and passion, including our next guest, Sharon Sorensen. She is an author, educator, and birding expert. Sharon, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. All right, we've talked so much today about passion and where those that begins for birds. And when did it start for you? When did it kind of bite you there? Well, you know, as a kid, of course, I've, I watched my parents feed birds and my dad would pitch out corn from leftover from the farm crops and there would be hundreds of doves and it was really exciting. But the, the one experience that really sparked the passion occurred when we had a blizzard in 1975. I looked out the window and saw a whole group of birds that I didn't recognize. One was a snow bunting and that did it. <laughs> I wrote that down in my little bird book, like Patrick showed us his. I had this little bird book. I write this down and I think, oh my gosh, I'm keeping a record of a bird that has shown up in my yard and this is so exciting. But you traveled through other, other parts of your life as a teacher before then you started writing about birds, but it was something that you always kept with you? I always watched the birds. I always worked toward attracting the birds to the yard. But uh, it wasn't until I really had some time after I retired that I had time to do the writing. And so I began writing newspaper columns uh, about 11 years ago and, and ultimately came up with the book Birds in the Yard month by month. How have you seen birding change over the last 10, 20 years? Oh, Christy, that's a loaded question because you know <laughs> what? There have been some very good things that have happened, but there have been some kind of sad things. All right, so give us a little bit of each here so we can understand what okay, you're talking about. Okay, good things. Uh, and we've heard John and, and uh, Melinda talk about this, how many people are watching birds. You know, they mentioned the 47 million, but put it in another term, bird watching is now the second most popular outdoor birding sport in the world. You have a lot of nodding going on in the audience yeah, right now, yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Second only to NASCAR racing, we're told. Mm -hmm. How about that? <laughs> that's a so, sad. As a result of all this enthusiasm, of course, that's had a major impact on the bird feeding industry, but it's really had an impact on the education about birds and birding. And so we have more, more field guides, we have apps for our smartphones, we have books like my own. We have magazines dedicated to birds and birding. There are regular newspaper columns and magazine columns. And then we see that there are all kinds of classes being offered and seminars and conferences. And so all of this has brought about a great deal of information to people and they're beginning to realize that there's a whole lot more to hosting birds than feeders and feed. It's really about habitat. Okay, so explain that for people who are just getting into birding. Okay, habitat is food, water, shelter, and places to raise young. For migrants, of course, it's just food, water, and shelter. When they get to their destination, then of course it's places to raise young. But you know, birds are irrevocably tied to the vegetation around them. And so everything that they need to eat, everything that they need for shelter, every piece of material that they need to, to build a nest, and every place they put that nest is dependent upon the vegetation around them. And birds have lost a lot of that habitat. So that's kind of the negative part that I wanted to mention. They've lost habitat. And so I can remember as a kid thinking, oh my gosh, the eastern meadowlarks are just singing everywhere. They're on top of every fence post. They're on top of every bush. They're on top of every twig. And now if I hear an eastern meadowlark, I come to a screeching stop to look and listen. They've declined by 80% in about the last 40 years. And so habitat destruction has been a really serious problem and we as backyard birders can do some things to help that. All right, so let's talk about that because I think when people hear this and they hear a lot of this information, it can be daunting saying, well, what I'm doing in my yard doesn't really make a difference or there's nothing that I can do that quite possibly can help, but there really is. There and so, really is. all right, so let's get started. How can someone who has never considered helping out birds before, how can they help migratory birds in their area in the Great Lakes Basin? The first thing we need to do in our yards is get rid of exotic species. That includes lawn. Lawns are virtually Homeowners associations worthless. maybe Not don't want to hear like that, that from you though, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> but there are wonderful substitutes. I mean, I, you know, in my neighborhood, the, my, I have to keep my neighbors happy mm -hmm. too. But instead of 
promoting lawn, I have mowed only borders and paths. And so what's there instead are native plants. And, and I think we heard Patrick mention this, they need to be of varying heights. We need tall trees, we need short trees, we need bushes and shrubs, we need tangles, we need vines, we need annuals and perennials and native grasses. When I say get rid of the lawn, I'm talking about those exotic kinds of grasses. Let's plant the native stuff, which tends to be short grass anyway. Okay, what else can we do? Well, once you've planted that native habitat, then that's going to attract the native bird, the native bugs, excuse me. And migratory birds eat bugs. Mm -hmm. Good example, a pair of grasshopper sparrows that will come here to nest, feeding a brood of young, will feed a bushel basket full of grasshoppers in just one season. So add that to billions of birds and oh my gosh, look what happens. So the mantra is, first to feed the birds, you must feed the bugs. And that's what the migrants need. And you get really nervous about that, <laughs> right? Right. But if you eliminate the pesticides in your yard, the birds will take care of the problem. In our own yard, where we have done this very thing, our yard list went from about 70 species to 164 species. Over how much time, would you say? <laughs> Well, you mean how long did yeah, it take? Yeah, how long did it take? Yeah, point? right. About okay. how long it's did it take? It's not an you? overnight thing. It okay. takes a long time for a tree to grow. So we're talking 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so it's it needs to be a commitment on the part of the homeowner and the bird watcher. What about shelter? Um, shelter, if you've planted the native stuff, the shelter will be built in. So what do they need? We're not talking birdhouses here because those are just for cavity nesters, and there are about 86 cavity nesters, that give or take, across this country. But when we're talking about migratory birds, we're not talking about birds that nest in cavities. We're talking about birds that need those bugs to eat, but they need protection when the storms come through. Imagine being outside when there's a vicious hailstorm or a vicious windstorm. So that native vegetation is going to provide protection, whether it's high canopy or ground cover. Every bird lives in its own habitat, and so we need that variety of habitat to provide that shelter. And I love the fact in your, uh, your book, is that birds in the yard, it makes it so simple yeah. for people who are beginning yes. out, and even people who are experts and have been birding for a very long time, a lot of very helpful information in there. Well, thank you, I hope so. It all comes from personal experience. I, we, some of us saw that movie called The Big Year, and it was really, kind of a strange bunch of characters there who did really weird things to get lots of birds in the course of a year. But I decided to do a big year in my own yard. And in the course of the year, I had 114 species. And it's like, why? Why did that happen? And this book really is the result of that because I found out that different birds visited different parts of my yard and they never changed their behavior in that respect. And real quick, in just a couple seconds that we have left, Sharon, I mean, you obviously have the passion for that. How important is it for us to take this passion and teach our younger generation, our kids growing up, to value the nature that we have right in our own backyard? Well, you know, if we don't pass the passion along, nothing's going to happen. And this dramatic decline that we've seen in bird populations would become so serious that we'll lose our birds. And if that happens, they are the bellwether of our environment and we'll be in serious trouble. But kids are like little sponges. You share the excitement and they just soak it up. They, they sure do, love it. don't they? they All right, it. Sharon Sorensen, thank you so much for joining me. We, we appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. You know, here on Great Lakes Now Connect, we like to keep people around the Great Lakes region on their toes a little bit with a pop quiz. So we hit the road to see what people really know about migratory birds. Take a look. What do birds eat? A lot of them eat seeds. Nuts, bugs. Uh, I know a lot of birds eat worms and probably small insects. Birds eat everything from small fish to grains to whatever. It depends on the type of bird. How does climate change affect birds? You know, maybe something to do with water levels. It might kill some of their food sources and might destroy their habitat. Climate change affects every living thing. As it starts to warm, the uh, climate starts to move a little bit further north. 
and they have to uh, either adapt to the uh, the changes in the the climates and the, cha the changes in their habitat, or they have to move. Why do some birds stay through the winter and others leave? Well, some leave because their their feathers can't keep them warm in the winter, and others can. I think because old birds don't want to fly down, they're too old. I would say because there's not enough food for them through the winter because they eat things that are, would not be available for them through the winter, so they go south for their food. Why are male birds more brilliant in color than females? The female uh, birds are like taking care of nest youth, that sort of thing, and male birds are attracting prey away from them. Probably because the female birds have to stay more camouflaged and protect their young. Men are always more show-offy than women. They're trying to attract a mate. Male birds are looking to attract mates, so they want to be uh, more brightly colored and catch their attention. What birds that fly through the Great Lakes are threatened or endangered? I would say it was probably the smaller birds, such as the finches, the um, chickadees. Ah, that's a good question. Is, this, there's, is there multiple? Mm -hmm. Sand crane, I don't know if that's one. I, can't, I have no idea. Blue jays? I would assume Kirtland warbler. I know that they're up in, what is it, Crawford County or something like that. A pop quiz, you know, can always catch you off guard, but you know that you're in an audience of birders when you hear them answering the questions in the audience while they're watching the video, Patrick. And we've got a very, we've got a very savvy crowd here. So why don't you tell me, though, how do you think they did? I was pretty impressed by those answers. We had some that weren't quite there, um, and some that were actually, I was, wow, they nailed it. Um, climate mm -hmm. change questions or a Kirtland's warbler is an endangered species. That was perfect, right on. Yeah, uh, Melinda, let me ask you, is it part of just this education and people being more aware of some of those questions and some of the, some of the answers that we're continually just trying to get the word out, for people to learn more information about birds in their area? Uh, well, you know, that, that natural curiosity and, and certainly, you know, there's, there's things about um, our behavior and bird behavior that are similar. So the, the question about why are males so brightly cover, colored made sense, particularly to the guys. Um, <laughs> and so there's some similarities, um, but there's lots of mystery about birds. And um, there are so many organizations nationally and locally and, and your nature centers where um, uh, families can uh, go and learn so much, and, um, uh, and and the best way is to get out and see them in, in nature. That's, that's the, the best way to learn. John, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I think um, we need people in this audience right here have a sense of wonder. Why is the male so brightly colored? Why did they choose that habitat? Where do they go? How many eggs do they lay in a year? All that sense of wonder. We need to pass that on to both children and adults and then engage them in meaningful citizen science and stewardship so they can be stewards of all of this. So we, it's a real challenge for us, particularly in an urban area. All right, let's head back to the audience and see what's on some of your minds. Who has a question that they want to? Do you have a question, Miriam at all? I see you holding a card, so I, so I say, she might have been writing a question down. What's your name? Rebecca Hagerman. Okay, Rebecca, tell us uh, what do you have on your mind. Well, I was really hoping um, that Dr. Dorn would give us a little treat, and if he was willing to demonstrate a bird call for us here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I promise, Patrick, this was not a plant. She was not a plant in the audience. <laughs> Thanks so much, Rebecca, because now I want to hear this. Do you guys have any good bird calls that you do? I bet you, I, you've got to have one or two. I have a wonderful app on my smartphone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't count. I, I told my daughter I would do a, a chickadee's call today, and 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 as you know, the chickadee. Does everybody notice the chickadee says cheeseburger? <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it while not, I'm not laughing. <laughs>
<laughs> I, I'll work on that later when I'm not laughing. So this will be in the next reel of Great Lakes Now Connect yes, Bloopers. Yes, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll record some of those and get them to you. I think. But while you're thinking about uh, about doing your bird call, I want to direct this question maybe to. There we go. Beautiful. Oh, yes. Beautiful. Uh, I want to uh, direct a, a question to Melinda. How do we reconcile um, all of the advancements that we have in technology and all the buildings and maybe even some of the things that we are trying to do environmentally sound practices like wind turbines? How do we reconcile those things with, with birds and do they cause any threat to the bird population at all? You know, it's a really good question, and it starts from, you know, urban planning, you know, landscape scale planning and the, and the advances there and thinking about um, how you incorporate green into your, into your landscaping. Um, the whole energy question, it's uh, so, you know, we, we need alternative energy. We do. And so how we find ways of uh, developing that technology so that it does not hurt, hurt wildlife. They're learning a lot about the... Um, Collisions of bats and birds and other, you know, and flight, flighted animals with respect to wind energy, for example. So that technology continues to improve, but it is a concern now, and there's, you know, lots of people that are looking at that. Um, buildings, there are new designs um, coming out all the time, new types of glass, new angles um, that that do not attract the birds, but actually prevent them from from not recognizing it as a hard surface. So. So we're, I think what's the good news is that we recognize we are creating problems for these birds and that they are correctable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could, I'd say that Could someone want to add? Go ahead. I, the root of it partially gets back to that wonderful science video we saw about understanding where birds congregate, where they migrate. And once we have that information, then we can start to do things like properly cite certain energy technologies or properly cite um, the, the, um, the urban and the, the building and the planning type things. Um, we obviously need our buildings and we need our urban centers, we need our energy sources, but the question isn't yes or no, the question is how and where and when. Okay, let's try to get somebody else from the audience. Does anybody else have a question? Oh, I see hands back there and so I'm going to do my best running over here. And I'm coming up behind you. Go ahead, ma'am. Tell us who you are, where you're from. Uh, Peg Campbell. I'm from Northville, Michigan. Let's go ahead and stand up for me, Peg. Uh, I am standing up. Oh, <laughs> <do you? laughs> go ahead. What do you think should be done about the predation of birds by outdoor cats? Thanks, Peg. Who wants to take that? Sure. Well, I'm a cat lover, so this is probably a good question for me. My cats have never set paw outdoors ever. I know that in spite of the fact that they are extremely well fed, they are nevertheless killers. And so I'm sure your concern is with the feral cats, the ones whose homeowners are not there to keep them indoors. And there are a good many programs in place for spay and neutering, and I think that's important. It's probably one of the best ways to deal with it. I, maybe my colleagues would have another suggestion. I think that, that that really sums it up. I mean, there's wonderful resources out there about um, cats and managing cats um, for wildlife, and, and it is a large issue. All right, and we are coming towards the end of our hour. It's been a fantastic discussion. We've gotten a lot out of it. So I guess, Patrick, I want to go to you. Or What are some of your final thoughts and things that we should be taking away here today? Thanks, Chrissy. A great discussion with our panelists. I think, um, for me, there's a couple very simple things here. First, take a moment this spring, get outside. Um, in your backyard, there's birding festivals all throughout this region. Take a moment and go to one, uh, do a class, go on a hike with somebody, and just kind of experience that wonder of nature. That'd be the first thing I'd do. Um, secondly, there are simple things, as Sharon pointed out, that you can do at your own place, in your own yard, that is going to attract and provide and support habitat um, for these birds. So that'd be the second thing I'd do. Secondly, one of the questions, or thirdly, one of the questions was, when I've done that, then I start to work with my partners and my neighbors and my broader community through policies, through local planning, through zoning. We can do those things. Um, but finally, it also takes major restoration efforts. John talked about some common turn habitat restoration. Um, we've seen restorations in western Lake Erie that are on the orders of, of ten or thousands of acres, and we need to get to that point as well. So thank you very much, uh, panelists. Thank you very much, Christy, and, and the audience. It's been a great discussion. It has been a great discussion. Our thanks to Patrick Doran, all of our guests today, and of course our studio audience, and to you watching along at home. Birds are a priceless part of our heritage, and we hope today's program has inspired you to learn more about migratory birds in the Great Lakes and to share that information with your friends. Make sure you go to greatlakesnow.org for more 
more stories and to learn more about the Nature Conservancy and their work around the Great Lakes Basin. For all of us at Detroit Public Television and the Nature Conservancy, I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks for joining us for Great Lakes Now Connect. We'll see you next time.